My name is Ron Weiniger and uh, I have been a police officer since 1993 and have kind of grown up in the in the profession. I have an older brother who is also a police officer that retired last fall from the uh, sheriff's office in Ada County and I, uh, I've had many many opportunities in my career to experience some some really awesome and wonderful and satisfying things and also had the opportunity to experience some not so great things and I think that's the way it is for for everyone in this profession everyone that's a first respond first responder we have that front row seat to the greatest show on earth um, and we also have the the front row seat to some of the most tragic and traumatic events uh, on earth and and we see just the the toughest times in people's lives and we experience some of the the most difficult things uh, that we've ever seen and done and and we also witness other people go through those things as well so you know it's all uh, it's all pretty exciting when you when you start in in this career or as a first responder regardless of whether that's uh, police or fire or paramedics dispatch and uh, we all come into it I think fairly, fairly idealistic and with the idea of we're going to help people and make a difference and do something noble and and all of those things that's that's the way I think most of us start out in our career at least everybody that I've seen as they start come into it pretty idealistic and I noticed over the years um, when I'd been on long enough to to really pay attention I guess and start seeing there were people that retired from the career and some of those people walked out after 20, 25, 30 years, whatever it would be, and they remained that idealistic, helpful, positive attitude, just like the day they walked in the career. And then I watched as other people um, left the career and retired bitter and angry and just hating people and hating life and, and just really miserable human beings and I couldn't help but start to think what in the world happens to some people along the way in that career that causes them to literally change from that uh, that helpful positive idealistic person to to the exact opposite of that and I felt like I have to do something or we have to figure it out uh, not just me, but we as a profession have to figure out what, what it is that happens to people along the way in this career that causes those changes to happen. And not only looking at people that retire, but you can't help but notice uh, people that just flame out uh, somewhere along the way. And marriages fail and uh, substance abuse happens and choices take place that cause folks to not even be able to finish the career. and. Uh, you see that as well and you think there, there's got to be something here. So I guess I come to that realization after, uh, after not only working in the career but just observing what's going on around me as others work in the career. And, and I have my own experiences, not any different than anybody else's, but I look back at some things that probably made a pretty big impact in my life. And I think about them and, you know, early on uh, being a party to and witness of and uh, you know very close to some child homicides and uh, some really tragic events uh, involving kids and, and me having young children at the same time in my life uh, those hit pretty close to home and then when I had been on uh, just not even four years had uh, an incident that I was involved with where a fellow officer was killed on a traffic stop and, and Mark Stahl was uh, was that officer and he's the only Boise police officer killed in the line of duty in the history of the department since the city was formed in 1896 and so uh, being very closely involved in that event and uh, having been shot and wounded in in that same event it was a it was a life-changing experience <coughs> excuse me for me and I think it was a life-changing experience for for a lot of people and in that in that time in the department was a was a rough rough go for us as I went through that experience and and that incident the shooting happened and I recognized obviously uh, what was happening and had one of those 
oh crap moments like I can't believe this is happening and this isn't this isn't the way it's supposed to go down and I just remember um, having experienced that that shooting burning white hot pain as the bullet went through my body and um, the bullet went through my lower abdomen and through my right hip and struck the sciatic nerve as it went through and so it felt like a lightning bolt went down my right leg and just blew my right foot off it felt like it had exploded as I fell backwards on the pavement I remember laying there uh, it's the middle of the night and it's dark and it was a little chilly and I was laying there and I was thinking to myself that um, this is not supposed to be how my life ends and um, as I as I lay there in pain and it was pretty chaotic scene and and I could see uh, people all around me I could see feet and I could see legs and I could see somebody laying on the pavement off to my right and I still to this day don't know if it was Mark um, that was laying there or if it was one of the two suspects that were also killed in that gun battle but as I laid there uh, amidst that chaos and, and feeling that pain I just uh, immediately thought I'm gonna die and I've never felt a pain that was so exquisite never felt anything that hurt that bad in my life and uh, I remember probably all happening in a, in a split second. It seemed to go really, really fast, but in that situation, it seems like a lot of thoughts flood through your mind. My first being, I'm gonna die, and then my second thought being, this really hurts, and if it hurts this bad, it means that I was not hit in the vest, um, because this is real pain. It's not like it just got you know, shot in the vest and it was gonna save me, and so I thought, well, if I didn't get in the vest, then I'm probably gonna live, because the vest is gonna protect me from uh, anything that's gonna kill me. Uh, somewhat erroneously obviously uh, thought process but the moment I thought I'm not gonna die uh, this hurts too bad I'm probably not gonna die um, then I started to realize that I couldn't move couldn't move my legs and I thought I'm probably shot in the spine and I'm probably gonna be paralyzed the rest of my life uh, all of these thoughts incorrect but they're they're what went through my head and and so I'm just laying there going from uh, one second to the next and thinking I'm going to die, then I'm not going to die, then I'm going to be paralyzed and not really knowing what the uh, end result was going to be. I had no idea what that would entail, but over the next few minutes, uh, obviously help arrived and, and I'm so grateful to the other first responders, not just my fellow officers on the scene uh, there, but the, the firefighters and the paramedics that showed up and ended up uh, treating and, and helping us and working on Mark and and taking us both to the hospital and as we're laying uh, laying there in that trauma room at the time and they were working on Mark and and uh, trying desperately to save his life and I remember it's it's very surreal uh, to think about that but I remember as uh, as it became evident that he was not going to make it and that he had passed away and, and just really not having an emotional reaction to that at the time but that emotional reaction would come several days later for me um, as I was able to actually attend his funeral and that was an impactful time certainly in, in a lot of people's lives in the valley but uh, but I think about you know Mark's family and the sacrifice that they made and the impact that that his life had on them and his death had on them and then going forward through the next uh, many many weeks and months uh, physically recovering and and going through physical therapy and doing all the things that that I did and then dealing with uh, what turned out to be chronic uh, pain from from that nerve damage of the bullet striking the sciatic nerve and ultimately, uh, you know, dealing with with just uh, shooting, burning pain, hitting, uh, recurring every every minute or two, and uh, going from not being able to sleep to just just being in pain. And that chronic pain, I, it gives me, uh, I guess, an understanding and, and an empathy for people who deal with that pain, regardless of what the cause is. Um, chronic pain can just suck the life out of out of you and over the next several months up to a year or so 
in dealing with that and trying every treatment they could figure out and everything known to man at the time I think was tried uh, on me and not really getting any relief and one one night in particular I remember being at, at home and you know my entire family was there my wife and two little kids and they were all asleep and it's the middle of the night and I remember just going from the couch to the chair to the bed to the floor to the you name it trying to trying to get comfortable to sleep and that that pain would just keep hitting every minute or two and and not being able to sleep and and just literally trying to pull my own hair out of my head and and having a conversation with uh, with myself and then with with God to say I don't think I can make it uh, if something doesn't give if something doesn't change uh, if I don't get some relief somehow I can't do it I can't live like this anymore and uh, it wasn't too long after that that uh, they tried a, it was somewhat experimental at the time, but a, a spinal cord stimulator. I was able to have a spinal cord stimulator implanted uh, in, my, in my back and, and it delivered an electric shock down the spinal cord to try to interrupt the pain signals from the damaged nerve uh, before it reached the brain. And it uh, didn't really make a lot of sense to me at the time, but they explained it and I was like, yep, great, I'll try anything. And it was able to provide some some relief and and just kind of tone that that severe pain down enough that I that I could survive and get through. Um, and so for the next several years, uh, that that really did provide some of that relief. And you know, all of that was was paid for by workers' compensation. And I was grateful that I didn't have to deal with a big load of medical bills on top of everything else and so that was that was a blessing in my life for sure to have that medical care uh, taken care of and paid for by the workers compensation and, and not having to struggle with that and then I look at you know as I as I translate and transition later in life and I see all of the issues that uh, first responders go through in relation to the stuff that we see and the trauma that we experience and not all of it's physical, clearly. Uh, there's a lot of mental anguish and trauma that, that first responders experience. And I'm grateful that, you know, <clears throat> fast forward 23 years almost, um, that some of those uh, post-traumatic stress injuries, those mental traumas that we experience are, are now actually covered by workers' comp and some help is available for those injuries as well. So uh, that gratitude is there as well right now. And I know it's, it's been a long time coming, but I think it's a, a helpful thing and a, and a pretty big thing for those of us who are in this, uh, in this profession, regardless of what it is, first responders uh, do experience those types of injuries as well as the physical ones. And so I guess my my way of, of dealing with everything and one of the things that has truly helped me over the years is it created a passion in me to uh, to try and help those others and as I mentioned before watching people change in their careers based on the traumatic events that they experience and some of the things that that they see and, and do um, it just makes me really want to help in some way and so I've had the opportunity to be involved in so many different things that have, I think, made a difference for others, but have also made a difference for me as I've studied and learned and, and really dug into critical incident stress and stress management in general, and especially as it relates to first responders. I've had the opportunity to, to really take advantage of training and education um, that helps me make sense of it and then also helps with, uh, with others. And so, um, many years ago, we started a peer support team within our own within our own department, our agency, and ultimately through that experience and seeing how helpful and beneficial it has been for some people in the department, had the opportunity to also help other agencies around us uh, do the same thing and, and provide some training. As I uh, received that education and training, and, and ultimately got involved in a, in a couple of different organizations and, and doing critical incident stress management as well as resiliency training through the, uh, the FBI National Academy Associates. I've uh, been able to just travel in many places in the United States and see that the, 
the issues are very much the same regardless of where you work and where you live. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing unique about this part of the country as it relates to these types of issues. Everybody has them, but it's been very rewarding for me to, to see local agencies around us um, begin those peer support programs and critical incident uh, stress management programs and, and I've had such wonderful opportunities to work with folks in the Ada County Sheriff's Office, uh, the Nampa Police Department, the Nampa Fire Department, the Meridian Police Department, um, Canyon County Paramedics, Ada County Paramedics, just uh, just all over the valley and, and even further out throughout the state of Idaho and uh, it's, it's just been very rewarding to to try and impact, uh, going back to the very beginning again, those people who come into this profession with the greatest of intentions and uh, the, the ability and desire to help people and help keep them on track and keep that, uh, that thin blue line that we talk about uh, healthy and able to be that thread that helps weave our, our society together and the fabric of of our society is is fractured and today there is no doubt uh, we're in a tough time uh, especially as it relates to law enforcement this is a, a very interesting and tough time and a climate in the country we are very fortunate to have the support that we have here in Idaho and uh, the good people of our community but there are also um, a lot of those who who would say that you know law enforcement isn't a noble profession and it isn't good and, and I have to stand up and say that is absolutely wrong. This is one of the most noble professions that I am aware of and I am grateful to and proud of the fact that I am a, a police officer and I've had the opportunity to serve in a number of different um, different areas, a number of different units and teams and specialties and a number of different ranks within our ag agency and every one of those opportunities has given me uh, has given me what I need to uh, to continue, and has also given me opportunities to help others, which uh, which is also what makes me tick sometimes. So I am I am very honored to be a part of this profession. I'm very honored to be a first responder, and I believe because I see it every day, there are men and women throughout this country and throughout the world that lay their lives on the line and sacrifice and uh, give everything they've got to the profession and it's up to us to take care of each other and take care of them so that they can indeed uh, enjoy the fruits of their labors and get the, uh, the satisfaction they need out of the work that they do and someday if they are fortunate as I am so fortunate to uh, to be nearing retirement, I still have ways to go, but uh, when they retire, uh, they can enjoy the rest that they need and want and uh, look back on a healthy and happy career that, that they're proud of. We've come a long ways in the last 27 years that I've been involved in the profession, and we have grown a lot, but there is still, no matter how hard we try, there is still a stigma attached to asking for help, for reaching out, for assistance. Uh, we we want to be tough and we want to be strong because we have to be strong for so many people every day and every night when uh, we're out there on the job. We are the people who respond to those calls for service to, when somebody needs help and they are frightened, they are scared, they're in the middle of a terrible situation. As recently as yesterday, we had a critical incident in the valley where Police responded to a very dangerous situation and, and were expected to deal with it and protect innocent people from harm. And day in and day out, night in and night out, uh, first responders are stepping up to the call for service and, and are willing to put themselves in harm's way and in danger. And with that, it takes a toll. There is no doubt that responding to critical incidents as well as all the other incidents that we respond to takes a toll and it's a burden. And at any given point in someone's career, it might be too much. It might overwhelm our coping mechanisms that normally work for us to deal with stuff and it's okay. 
it's okay to be overwhelmed, it's okay to need help, it's okay to take a step back and say, that one was a little too much for me right now. I think I might need a shoulder to lean on. And so we have to get past the stigma um, that says we can't be vulnerable, that we can't be um, weak. I don't think it's really weakness, but we automatically think it is that we're weak if we ask for help. And had to move a piano recently, and guess what? I couldn't do it by myself. We needed a little help. It was just a little too much. And anybody that's moved a piano probably knows that it's probably not a one-man job or a one-woman job. Uh, sometimes it takes a little more. Just like having an injury, whether it's physical or mental, um, causes us to need to ask for help, to go for assistance, and it's no different than breaking your leg or spraining your wrist. Uh, it's no big deal to go to the doctor for some, for some uh, treatment when we have an injury. And the same has got to be true for mental in injury and for stress injuries that happen throughout our career. Everybody has them. I don't know any officer that's gone 25 or 30 years without a physical injury in their career. Everybody gets hurt, everybody gets banged up, everybody breaks something or sprains something or you know has issues. And the same has got to be true for the mental side of things. But for so many years we have pushed back and not sought treatment for those things. And uh, we have to get better, we have gotten better. We have to continue to get better. And, and agencies have a responsibility if you're a leader of an agency, you have a responsibility to take care of the people who work in your agency. And if you don't fulfill that responsibility, you're letting people down. And I know nobody in this profession wants to let their coworkers down. If you're a member of the public, I also think you have a responsibility to take care of those who have served your community. And that goes for military, veterans, as well as first responders and those who put themselves in harm's way uh, so that the rest of us can sleep safely at night knowing that they are out there taking care of those situations that require intervention. I'm grateful for the support and the help that I have received and, and it's just my uh, overwhelming desire to be able to reach out and help others to, uh, to get what they need so that they can remain intact and uh, ready to go and protect and serve and do this job all over again tomorrow and uh, it's, it's a privilege and an honor.